Kia ora koutou, uh, nā mahi nui ki uh, Manaki Whenua and welcome to our second day of Conservation Week. We are here in the New Zealand Arthropod Collection and I'm joined by Collections Manager Sarah Tassel who's given up her time to show us around the collection today. So if you have any questions, please type them on our Facebook page and just comment and we will ask them throughout the tour and at the end as well. So welcome. Thanks, thanks for visiting. Cool, so we're just going to start by having a general introduction to the Arthropod Collection. So do you want to talk us through what is housed here, how it's housed, we're in a very secure facility mm -hmm. in Auckland, yep. and why that is. Okay, so the New Zealand Arthropod Collection is a collection of mainly New Zealand uh, invertebrates, so animals without backbones, not like vertebrates like bats and birds, but invertebrates, that includes insects and spiders, centipedes, things like that, um, and specifically they're arthropods, which means that they're invertebrates without backbones that have a crunchy exterior exoskeleton uh, and jointed appendages. They're not squishy worm things. So there are other invertebrates like yeah, uh, worms and snails. Uh, we don't hold big collections of those. We're mainly arthropods and we're mainly a collection of, um, of arthropods that are found on land. Um, yeah, and, and we, there are a lot of them. There's there are, seven yes. Million. So we're in one of the rooms um, that houses this collection. There's about seven million specimens that we hold. Um, we have two rooms like this. This is one of the vaults uh, that holds the pin specimens. We have about one million pin specimens, which we'll show you in a sec. Not all of them, just like examples. Um, and we also have a, a collection of microscope slides. Um, probably about 100,000 of those slides. And then we have about 6 million specimens housed in special uh, stores, uh, which we won't go into today, uh, which contain uh, insects and other invertebrates stored in, in ethanol alcohol. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the format that we keep things in. Um, we keep these rooms, and this is yeah quite a big room here, but it's kept at a temperature range of about 18 degrees all year round and it has low humidity. And we do that because we want to keep these specimens uh, safe and sound for hundreds of years if possible, um, so indefinitely. Uh, and those conditions, that temperature and humidity control allows us to make sure these these uh, specimens don't break down. And it's also why we keep a lot of these pinned insects in, in drawers. We pulled some out today to show you, but generally we keep them in drawers uh, so that they're away from the lights, uh, so they don't get um, broken down or degraded by light over time. Cool, let's yeah. have a little look at Yeah, come and have a look at these. Uh, how so, that process works. Yeah, so this is an example of how we, um, we prepare and how we sort of uh, store our specimens. So these are tiny moths um, that have all been very carefully um, pinned out so that you can see all of the external features on their bodies that you would need to be able to identify what species um, they are. So when you see a dead moth on the windowsill at home, it's all often crumpled up and you can't really see the features very well. But if you want to study it for uh, scientific research, then this is um, how you really want them to be um, stored. And so each little uh, pinned moth here has actually got its own special label underneath where we record where and when um, this, this uh, individual was collected and who by and what kind of habitat it was collected. Um, and it's a record of where the species has been found through time um, in New Zealand. And in this case, we've actually got some quite old specimens in here. We have some from, I think, 1919. So that's um, basically 100 years ago, exactly, um, these moths were collected. And we have some older material in the collection too. We have specimens that go right back to about the 1870s. And so this collection has a record through time of uh, invertebrates in New Zealand from 1870s all the way through to 2019. And we can use that as an amazing um, scientific resource uh, for understanding New Zealand biodiversity. Um, but we also, Although the most of the collection is uh, native New Zealand uh, species, we also have um, specimens of introduced species, so things that have arrived uh, since usually brought in by humans um, or in, uh, enabled by uh, human um, arrival, um, especially since um, 
European settlement. Um, but we also have some material from overseas, mainly from um, the Pacific. Uh, we hold lots of material from the Pacific Islands uh, uh, on behalf of them, but they can access it whenever they need. And we also um, hold material from Australia and South America because we share many um, species in common and, or genera in common um, with those places. Um, and we also have some material from other parts of the world as well. Cool. So obviously a huge part of this is the preservation process. Mm -hmm. And you've brought out some specimens over here to give us a little Oh yes, should we have a look at some of the other uh, formats? Yeah. Yeah, what have so, we got here? well, I'll get back to these big ones here in a second. But yeah, this is an example of some of the microscope slides that we have. Um, these are mites, so um, they're kind of related to spiders. You might know ticks and things. Well, these are, uh, there's plenty of mites that also live in the soil um, that are tiny. And really, you couldn't pin this up because you would not be able to see it. It's about, they're about the size of pinheads or smaller. And so we actually put them on microscope slides like this so that we can study them under a microscope. So that's, that's those. And then this is an example of what our um, specimens preserved in alcohol look like. These are cockroaches. Um, and we've got 10,000 of these sorts of jars in our ethanol stores, all holding vials of um, insects and, and lots of spiders as well. Um, in them. So that's the other way that we keep things. Um, keeping them in ethanol um, is really good because it actually takes up a lot less space than keeping them pinned out in drawers. And it also is often easier to extract um, DNA from these sorts of specimens too. And that's really important for scientific research uh, to understand things like what species are which and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then these more larger critters. These ones, yes. Well, I think a lot of people will recognise uh, these, wetter. Um, these are a really great example of, I guess, the really unique thing about New Zealand uh, fauna. So as you'll probably know, like New Zealand's got a lot of flightless, uh, really bizarre birds like the kiwi and the kakapo. Uh, but that kind of large, flightless, um, characteristic isn't just restricted to, to, the, to the fluffy in, uh, vertebrates, but it's also characteristic of a lot of our invertebrates. So these are all uh, giant wetter and tusk wetter that actually don't have wings. They're big, they're flightless, and they were able to persist in New Zealand because there weren't lots of mammalian predators. And a lot of these wetter um, are threatened these days. They're only found on small offshore islands. And that's because like our kiwi and our kakapo, uh, they aren't very well equipped, even though they look scary. Um, they're not very well equipped for dealing with uh, things like rats and stoats, um, which basically uh, snack on these like little walking hamburgers because um, they're relatively defenseless. They've got these spines on their back legs that they can kick with. And some of the males have the big um, mandibles at the front, those big jaws that look really scary, but they're really no match um, for a rat or a mouse even. Uh, so. Yeah, they're one of the, the groups of invertebrates in New Zealand that need quite a lot of special conservation care. Um, yeah. And over the back there, we've got some spiders. We, we do, yes. This is an example, I'll bring these out so you can see a little better. Most of our spiders are in alcohol because they're easier to preserve that way. Um, but we do also have these ones here pinned. Um, you might recognize um, the Avondale spider, which is actually not a native um, spider to New Zealand, um, it's from Australia, uh, but a lot of these other ones are native spiders. Yeah. Cool. And let's have a little look through. There's a lot of drawers. Um, mm -hmm. To give everyone the perspective, there's a lot of drawers down a lot of aisles, and we're going to go have a little look to yes. see what's in them. Yes. Oh, should we go down this one? This is yes. some more moths, which we've already started to look at, but. Um, so this collection is a little different to maybe um, collections that exist at museums. Um, in museums you can go and visit exhibition spaces uh, and, and see um, some of the contents of their collections. But this collection, the uh, NZAC, doesn't actually have a, an exhibition space. And that's because we're primarily a research uh, collection, which means that um, my job is almost like a librarian of dead things. 
uh, and my job is to make sure that this collection is as accessible as possible um, to researchers in New Zealand, but uh, also overseas. Uh, and we, we send loans to people, um, we digitise specimens, so we take images of them and we database. Um, we also do things, and I'll just bring this one out, um, we also do things like take legs off specimens so that they can be um, barcoded or um, have DNA sampling done. So that's what's happened with these ones here. These little moths have had some legs pulled off uh, and sent off to get um, uh, DNA barcoding done. Um, so that's really kind of the focus. That's why people don't come in here all the time. We're not taking tours all the time. It's We try and keep this uh, clean and secure um, so the specimens are going to be kept um, uh, for perpetuity really forever. Um, and we try and make the information from the specimens as accessible as possible. So you can access a lot of the records of these specimens um, online through um, our data portal on our website, but also internationally there's a, there's a platform you can go to and search a map of New Zealand and pull up what records are available uh, from our collection on there. Um, so it's, although it's uh, used probably more by researchers, um, you can, uh, anyone can actually access this information. And how does this collection compare? This is New Zealand's largest collection. Mm -hmm. How does it compare to the collections that museums um, would have? Yeah, so we aim to be, we're a national collection, which means we've tried to have the most complete record uh, possible um, of New Zealand uh, invertebrate biodiversity. So we have representation from all parts of New Zealand, including the offshore islands and the sub-Antarctic islands. Um, whereas uh, the museums um, have often got a more regional focus um, in the part of the country that they're based. Um, but we are very much a network. We work with the museums and we uh, interact a lot and share lots of information and specimens. And we work together to, um, I guess, maintain these collections uh, for everybody. Cool. And what else do we have? Oh, yeah. Exotic some oh yeah, should we go right down the end and have a look at it? some exotics? Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, like I said, we have materials from the Pacific, but we also have uh, a smaller amount of, um, of specimens from overseas, uh, including some collections of insects that have been donated from, I guess, uh, collectors in the past. So um, one of those is an example here of beetles that have come from, from Africa uh, and from Southeast Asia. So here's uh, some from Southeast Asia, Pre pretty amazing, spectacular beetles. It's a little dark, but you can probably make out the colours there and the size for scale. There's my hand. These, these are really big beetles. Um, these particular beetles um, come from a family called the Cerambicids, the longicorn beetles. And they may look slightly familiar because they have a... Uh, local New Zealand, um, well they have many local New Zealand sort of relatives including the hoo-hoo beetle which you might know um, which is one of New Zealand's largest beetles. Um, they look a little bit like really Telezone. Colours. They do have some amazing uh, colours which uh, really make them stand out in here but sometimes in the forests where they came from and the habitats that actually they camouflage quite well. Um, yeah. Yes, and this is some of our slide collection for the mites. Um, we do a lot of work, especially with mites, uh, looking at uh, species that um, feed on um, crops and other mites as well that are actually used as uh, biological control agents to uh, eat things that feed on crops. So uh, Manaki Whenua Land Care Research does a whole range of research on looking at how we can better protect uh, native biodiversity but also um, our important agricultural crops and um, I guess our economy in New Zealand. Because we have a lot of things that we don't want here to. We do. Everyone knows when you come into New Zealand that you must declare all your fruit and vegetable. We can't bring any in. You get in big trouble and that's because we want to make sure we keep New Zealand uh, as pest free as possible uh, and yeah. <laughs> Yes. Let's have a look at some of the monarchs and the um, uh, okay, things yes. that we've got. Yes. Uh, we'll just head back up this way. Yeah, so the monarch, where are we? We have to get out. Of the, we have a lot of beetles. The 
beetles, as you might know, are um, one of the most diverse groups of invertebrates, and so a lot of this collection is actually dedicated to beetles. That's why we have to keep walking up and down through them. Um, but uh, back to the butterflies. So a lot of people will recognise these, the monarchs. Uh, this is an example of how, I guess, the fact that collections are kind of like a time capsule. It allows us to look back in time at where species um, were found uh, in the past um, and helps us to understand where they might be found in the future with things like climate change and habitat modification and habitat loss. So the monarch butterfly wasn't always in New Zealand. Um, it might have come across occasionally, but it would have had trouble surviving because its food plant wasn't here. Or well, there are different species over there that you've just, we'll get back to them in a sec. Um, the monarch was um, able to establish once we started growing its food plant, the swan plant in New Zealand, uh, about, I think it was in the 1800s that, the, that they were able to establish. And so we have specimens that go all the way back in time and we can look at the population of, of monarchs um, since that time to, to today. Um, and we can look at things like um, how their populations have changed, their distributions changed, all sorts of things we can do by having that actual specimen, not just a photo or a written description, but we can actually go back in time almost with uh, to 1870 when we pick up one of these specimens from that time, which is there isn't really anything else like that um, available to researchers. So it's a pretty special uh, resource. Um, pop those away. Uh, in this tray here, um, we have... Um, a threatened species, the forest ringlet butterfly, which is a beautiful butterfly that lives in New Zealand native forest. Um, these specimens are really important because, as I was describing before, they all have a little um, label underneath them which describes when and where they were caught. Uh, and that's really useful because it gives scientists a really great idea about um, the kind of food plants that they need and the kind of forest type that they need to survive. And that can help conservation planners um, to work out the best place to protect uh, threatened species like these um, and set up reserves um, and to manage populations. That's very cool. And we have some really nice plume moths Ooh. next door. Yes, oh, peruli moths? Yes, peruli yes. moths. Yes, that's right. Oh, I've run away, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, lots of moths. Um, I think, again, these are um, a moth species that some of you might recognise. Um, they're one of the biggest moths in New Zealand. They're just gorgeous, um, the Pururu moth. Um, the adults don't feed. They spend a lot of time being a caterpillar, munching on food in the forest, but they don't live that long as adults. Um, this is probably a good example of why we have to have um, multiple uh, individuals in our collection to represent any species. This is one species of moth, but as you can see, there's a huge range of colour, um, there's differences between the males and the females, there's different patterning, uh, and we need to be able to um, capture this diversity of form in our collections so that we can understand the range of variability in, in native species uh, and also work out whether there's big enough population differences where there might be cryptic species. Um, I guess it's just one individual wouldn't allow us to fully understand a species, so we, we must have multiple um, individuals from all, uh, both sexes and from juvenile forms, so eggs, caterpillars, adults, and from not just one location in New Zealand, but multiple locations so that we can understand population dynamics and answer lots of questions about their ecology and their behaviour. And so the collection contains some really old specimens. It does. And but also things are still being collected? Yeah, so we're pretty strategic, we're pretty careful about what we collect. Um, we, we have to uh, abide by a code of conduct and we have to apply for permits. Um, so we don't just go out and collect willy-nilly. Um, we target areas where we don't have many specimens and also groups where we have not enough to be able to understand things like um, their distribution um, or even um, potentially find new species. So we're still discovering new species all the time in New Zealand, or at least um, they're new to, to science. Um, and so that's why we still need to keep um, collecting 
to, to find and describe those new species, uh, to understand, again, how these are changing over time, the, the population, the distributions. Um, we, we have to continue to collect. But we can also, these days as well, uh, use uh, photographs. Uh, we can use um, things like iNaturalist, the app, um, to help fill in the, the blanks, I guess, that these collections, um, we, we, we always have gaps. And so yeah. things like that can really help. And that's something that the general public can help with. Anyone can take some photos uh, and of insects that they find uh, in their garden or their school, and they can submit those to iNaturalist and get some identifications and add to the data set of um, distribution records for New Zealand invertebrates. And uh, insects are sort of commonly talked about in the news being on the decline. Mm -hmm. And you've got some, you've brought some other sort of speci species that are endangered or almost extinct over. Should we have a look at Oh, them? yeah. So, yeah. yes, we can look at some of those. So, globally, people are concerned with um, insect declines. Uh, and collections like ours can help inform our understanding of that. We're actually not super sure exactly what's happening um, because we we don't have a complete picture. So we're we're using collections to help with that, but there's still so much to be known. Mm -hmm. uh, but some species certainly are threatened, and we we know this. Uh, and so this is an example here. This is an example, and I don't know how close you can get in here. These are tiny, tiny. Here's it. But these are bat flies. They live in the colonies of New Zealand bats, um, which are themselves endangered. Um, these flies are flightless. Uh, if they want to get around, they have to hitch a ride on a bat to move around, so they don't actually move very much. Um, and they're really dependent on the bats. They eat their poo, which is called guano, uh, and they live in their colonies because they're nice and warm. Um, they're amazingly uh, modified for this special environment. They don't, yeah, they don't have wings. They're really hairy. Um, they have weird eyes. They just don't look anything like a fly. Do you want me to try and pick one up? Yeah. I can try and get one. Let me see this one. Oh, this one's probably better. These were described by a scientist that worked at Manaki Whenua. Um, Dr. Holloway, she received a package containing some live specimens of these flies. I think they were live. Uh, and she realized that they were something very unusual. And so she set out to describe these um, and also make sure that they could be protected because we knew that they were dependent on this threatened species of bat. Um, and these two were going to be, to be threatened. Um, so I guess that's a, that's a good example of, we, we didn't know about this, this animal um, we were able to describe it as a new uh, species and that allowed us to understand that it's so restricted to this really tiny um, tree hollows where the, the bats are roosting that they also need protection. Uh, and we wouldn't have known that if we didn't know the species existed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and sometimes, and here's an example of another fly. I love flies, so I'm going to show lots of flies, but um, of a fly that was considered once, it's like these ones up here with these amazing dark wings, that were considered to be one of the rarest flies in the world. They've also got the word bat in their name, but it's the bat wing fly, kind of because they look like the Batmobile um, with these big cloak-like wings. And um, they're only found, well, they're found in the South Island and they were thought to be really rare um, and possibly endangered and they were listed as such. And then a research scientist visited our collections and all the other collections in New Zealand too, and wrote down um, all of the information on where these flies are being collected. And when they looked at that, they realised that actually they've been collected from many different locations in the South Island. They're probably uncommon, but they weren't rare. And so we we're actually able to downgrade their threat status from endangered to, um, to I think they were designated as being kind of safe and, and not at risk of extinction. Um, and that was a few years ago now. That kind of work would be made even easier now and in the future because instead of having to have someone come around and physically visit all of the collections and write down that information, they can actually do that online just by accessing our data set. So one of the big jobs that 
I am involved with now is actually making sure that as many of these specimens as possible um, have their little labels digitised so that they can be accessed to answer all sorts of questions without the need to come and write it all down by hand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so these, um, this collection is obviously incredibly important and such a valuable resource for researchers and everybody in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, what would it be like if we didn't have something like this? Mm. It's a good question because, yeah, it is a funny thing to have such a big collection of dead insects and, and they cost money to maintain. Um, but it would be really difficult for us to manage um, our native species in New Zealand um, if we didn't know what they were or where they occurred. And really that's what this collection allows us to do. It's the base reference that allows researchers to understand what is a native species in New Zealand, what's introduced, uh, where it was found in the past and where it might be found in the future. Uh, and so a lot of uh, the decisions that collection, sorry, that, um, that land managers uh, like DOC, um, other government agencies need to make about how they can best look after our native species relies on information like that. Mm -hmm. It would be very hard to make good decisions on how to protect species if you didn't know what food plants they need to survive, if you didn't know which islands they're found on and have been found on in the past, uh, and if you don't know much about what kind of climate range and so on that they can tolerate. Um, so we kind of are this space information supply uh, for, for people to use to answer all sorts of questions. Yeah. yeah. We've got some cool in, uh, stick insects over here. Yeah, well, um, smile. yes, this is a pretty interesting group. Um, New Zealand has quite a diverse fauna of stick insects. This is one of the biggest species. Look at the um, amazing, like, camouflage. Yeah, well, the, so the family, sorry, the order um, of phasmidae, uh, which is the stick insects, the phasmid bit of it comes from the word phasm or phantom. And that refers to um, their amazing camouflage, so that they kind of miraculously appear out of nowhere sometimes, um, because yeah, they just blend in so well. They're, they're pretty common in, or a lot of the species are reasonably common in, in New Zealand, but you just don't see them because they're up high in the canopy and they're mainly active at night. And during the day, they're very busy doing their best to look like a stick. So yeah, you don't always see them. Um, but you were talking before about the importance of keeping, you know, cats inside because oh, yeah. they do eat insects as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's something that you can do at home um, is um, if you do have a pet cat, a bit like we all know that cats eat birds, um, but they also eat a lot of insects and they particularly like eating big insects <laughs> like stick insects and wetter and even monarch butterflies as well. Um, and so by making sure that your cat's inside at night, you can help to reduce that kind of... Um, predation on, on native species um, and you can also um, do quite a lot to plant um, plant species in your gardens that uh, things like the stick insects like. Um, they actually eat a range of different um, native species of plant and you can put them in your garden and encourage them to come and live there. So we're going to wrap things up shortly. Mm -hmm. If there's anything that anyone would like to go back and see please comment it on the uh, live stream or if there are any questions please let us know we're just going to have a little final tour around of all the cool things that are housed here should we have a look at some of the bumblebees oh yes we should go down yeah so where are we I have to go down a little bit further oh here we are um these are so cute and very um even though they're not native to new zealand um they can be important for pollinating some crops, especially in greenhouses. But the reason that I pulled these out before is that, um, is that sometimes it's not actually the animal themselves that is the only thing we can use um, to look at um, conditions in the past and understand what's happening today. And the bees are a good example of that because um, they'll often have pollen um, that are captured on their bodies, on their wings, sorry, on their their abdomen on their backside and all that hair uh, and on their legs and we can actually take that pollen and uh, identify the plants um, that these bees were feeding on in past decades and centuries even in some of the, the older collections in the world uh, and so that can give us an idea on things like how uh, their feeding preferences have changed over time perhaps in um, 
relation to um, changes in agriculture and native habitat. Um, and so there's all these sorts of questions that you can answer with these specimens that are far beyond the original reason that they may have been collected in the first place, which perhaps was to describe a new species or to document um, the existence of a species in a certain area. We can now do things like look at pollinating networks and look at uh, disease uh, spread throughout the world, like uh, the Lyme's disease in America or the Zika virus. We can look at where the mosquito population that carries the Zika, the Zika virus uh, has been found over time. So there's lots of different questions that can be answered from these specimens that aren't necessarily just to do with, with the individual bee. Yeah. What do we have back there? Oh, um, we have some, some wasps. So another introduced species, uh, one that people tend to um, not want to run, run into, but uh, these are some specimens going back to the 50s of, of European wasp um, that have been in New Zealand. Uh, and they've been used in different studies looking at, uh, I guess, the process and spread and infestation of, of wasps in New Zealand. And as you probably know, they're a big pest, especially in uh, the beech forests in the South Island. We can use collections to better understand um, the way they interact with our native ecosystems and how that's changed over time. So we've had a question come in around the frames and the drawers because they're obviously all um, the same. Mm -hmm. Do we um, get them made or do we make them ourselves? How we get them made. Happen? Yeah, we get them made specially. Um, and yeah, they're all custom fit. They actually have a number on the back of them. So each one has its, the lid and the box have a match. Oh, they do match. Um, sometimes they don't and that's a, a problem. So um, yeah, they're all individually identifiable um, and they're amazing to work with. Yeah, they keep um, the specimens nice and safe. They've got little foam buffers in them um, and the boxes that these like white trays that we have here have foam in them so that it, um, the specimen pins stick into it really nicely and they don't get um, vibrated around uh, and get knocked off their pin. So yeah mm -hmm. okay cool is there anything else that you would like to show us in particular um i think we've covered quite a lot okay yeah great yeah. well uh, namahi nui kia koutou thank you so much for watching and tuning in to hear about our nzac new zealand arthropod collection housed at our manaki whenua site in auckland Thank you so much for your time, Sarah. You're welcome. And um, if anyone does find any critters in their backyard and they're wondering what it is, you can go to my naturalist website and that will give you a bucket load of information. And you can also go to our website, um, have a look for more information on this mm -hmm. Facebook page or the New Zealand Arthropod Collection Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. People can um, also use the What's This Bug pages that we have. So if you have a an insect or a spider and you would like to find out maybe more details about what insect it is, you can take it through um, the key that we have on there. Yeah. And just to remind people, unfortunately, you can't come and visit this mm -hmm. collection. Um, it's in a really secure facility and it has a lot of parameters around it. So um, thank you so much for tuning in to watch it. Thanks for visiting. Ka kite.